Hey everyone, this is Cobain the Christian, and welcome to another edition of Bible Bites. Before getting into the subject of this video, I want to remind you that uh, if you have not already become a patron and you're financially capable of doing so, any contribution to my Patreon would be profoundly appreciated, as it is integral to the continuing productivity of this channel. For those who have already made contributions, I really can't express how thankful I am and how uh, moved I've been by the response that I've gotten. I also wanted to say that in response to public demand, I have decided to launch the content that is produced on this YouTube channel also in podcast form, hosted on anchor.fm, which is going to – anchor then serves to distribute the content out to other podcasting platforms and it's completely free so it's very useful so when that uh, when the audio for this video is uploaded there i will link that below under the patreon link but today i want to discuss uh, briefly and i'm going to make a valiant attempt at, at, at being concise i want to discuss the nature of the pentateuch the nature of its trajectory and the nature of its main theme. Now, John Salehammer points out in his meaning of the Pentateuch that we tend to assume that the central theme of the Torah, the five books of Moses, is obedience to the Sinai Covenant. The hope implicitly in the five-book Torah is thought to have been placed on the Sinai Covenant. But when one actually looks at the structure of the Pentateuch, and when one looks at its arrangement and the thematic arc that can be seen in this arrangement, serious problems with this view arise. The Pentateuch begins with the creation of the world, the planting of a garden, and the installation of man as high priest in that garden. Man is the instrument by which the world will be sanctified as he follows out the four rivers from Eden, gardenifying and citifying the creation after the pattern of God who planted the garden before his eyes. However, Adam rebels against God, seeking to have life on his own terms, and he is cursed with death embodied in an exile. He is exiled from the Garden of Eden, he is cut off from the Tree of Life, and this cutting off, this exile from the Garden, facilitates a internal exile within the human family, such that there is a schism which originates in the life of the human family, that whose very nature is harmony and communion after the image of the Trinity, begins to face the curse of internal strife. And that strife is replicated and intensified throughout the book of Genesis until it gets so catastrophic that the uh, uh, children of Jacob murder their own younger brother in the climax of the heinous acts in Abraham's dysfunctional family, but it is through that that the nations, not only Israel, not only Jacob's family, but the nations, all the nations across the face of the earth who were subjected to the famine, they're all redeemed in and through that act. Now, we can clearly see that in the book of Genesis, we have a miniaturized anticipation of the story of Jesus writ large. But in relation to our purpose today, I just want to call your attention to that theme of exile. In Genesis chapter 1, Adam and Eve are exiled from the Garden of Eden, and they are exiled from the Tree of Life. And at the end of the Pentateuch, we meet Moses and Israel in exile. The end of the Pentateuch, in terms of its literary integrity, ends in the same place that it began, in the wilderness. Adam was exiled into the wilderness from which he was created, and we end the Pentateuch with a hope of entering into the land under the leadership of Joshua, but the actual narrative in the five-book Torah ends outside of the land. Now, this isn't just a mere happenstance of the uh, way in which these texts were written. It's not just an accident. Uh, Instead, the transition from Moses to Joshua signifies and embodies the larger transitions between the Old and New Covenants, a transition which is prophetically spoken of in the Pentateuch itself. You see, the Pentateuch does not give Israel's hope in the Old Covenant. 
The Pentateuch does not enunciate Sinai in itself as giving any reason for Israel's hope of final inheritance and redemption. We see in the history of Israel this two-covenant pattern. For example, Moses comes down from the mountain the first time. He sees Israel committing idolatry, and he has to liturgically renew the covenant by being put into a cave and coming out of that, or the cleft of a rock, and coming out of that cleft on, uh, of a rock on Israel's behalf. We're then told that Moses was horned with the glory of God. This Michelangelo's famous uh, interpretation of the prophet with horns is actually rooted in the language of the Hebrew text. Now, horns signifies Moses' standing as a calf, because the golden calf was meant to be the instrument by which Israel accessed their God. But in reality, Moses is the instrument by which Israel accesses God, because he is the prophet and selected mediator by which the divine presence comes down, which is why his face is radiant with divine light. And when Israel sees him, they step back and were told that they were afraid. Just as Moses was afraid when he encountered the God of Israel in the burning bush, just as Israel was afraid when the God of Israel descended in Mount Sinai, so now Moses descends and Israel reacts to him the way that they had first reacted to God. So Moses is the sacrificial calf. He goes through a death and resurrection experience. And in that death and resurrection experience, he facilitates the renewal of the covenant. The transition between the first instance of the Mosaic Covenant, the breaking of the covenant, and the renewal of that covenant anticipates the transition between Old and New Covenants, which forms the macrostructure of biblical history. The first covenant is associated with the first exodus, and the last covenant is associated with the last exodus, that is, the resurrection of Jesus. But this is also embodied in the transition of Deuteronomy to Joshua, that Moses dies in exile. He dies outside the land. He dies uh, having been exiled because of his failure to believe. Now, I want you to notice how significant the language of faith and belief is in this context. Because in the New Testament, justification by faith is not enunciated in random contexts uncorrelated with larger biblical themes. On the contrary, justification by faith is consistently associated with the fundamental Abrahamic promise, which is rooted in the larger promise of a redemption for Adam and the human family. The Abrahamic promise is constituted by a promise of a family on the one hand and a grand inheritance on the other hand. And in Genesis chapter 15, when we are told that Abraham believed God, we are being told not that Abraham simply believed God kind of abstractly or that the passivity or the passive nature of faith allows God to impute a alien righteousness onto Abraham. Instead, Abraham trusts that God is going to fulfill the promises he is making, namely to bring life out of his already dead body, as Paul will describe it, and to give the seed of Abraham that life brought out of his already dead body to give that seed an inheritance. In Exodus chapter 14, when Israel is about to cross the Red Sea, the fundamental issue is whether Israel is going to believe in God and his servant Moses. So also in Numbers 20, God curses Moses for failing to obey to the letter God's explicit commandments. And he says, it is because you have not believed in me. Now, many people read this and they think this sounds quite harsh. And if it were any other Israelite, that would be true. But Moses has lived his whole life in intimate dialogue with the presence of God. His face has been irradiated with that divine light. Uh, on account of this, he has correspondingly less excuse. He is more culpable. Now, Moses, of course, is a saint. He's a great man of God. Nevertheless, he was subject to this curse of exile because of his failure to do exactly as God commanded him. Compare Noah, uh, in the account of Noah, we're told again and again and again, Noah did exactly as God commanded him. So Moses dies in exile, but his successor does not. His successor is named, what do you know, Joshua, Yehoshua, or Jesus. Joshua is of the tribe of, he's a descendant of Joseph, I believe he's the tribe of Ephraim. Remember, Joseph is divided into two half-tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. 
Joseph dies at 110 years old, which is an age of death he shares with only one other biblical character, namely Joseph himself. And the figures of Joseph and Joshua are connected in a host of interesting ways. In addition to their genealogical connection, we have major thematic connections pertaining to the nature of kingship in the scriptures. Now in the scriptures, a king, and there are many uh, people and nations who have kingly or royal characteristics without holding the office of king, without wearing a crown, uh, the notion of kingship, the inner essence of the concept, has to do with dominion or ownership over the creation and in relation to the creation. And the essence of dominion or ownership is one's capacity to restructure and manage that territory as one sees fit. But how does that right and capacity to manage the territory get established in the first place? Well, it is through the right of conquest, because conquest is the post-lapsarian embodiment of a restructuring and enforcement of sovereignty, or an enforcement of property ownership. The conquest of Canaan, and in fact the concept of conquest across the nations of the world, is an establishment of sovereignty. Now, it's interesting that in Deuteronomy 8, the word used for wealth is the very word that is used in some places for Israel's armies. And we see in the book of Genesis that Abraham buys land in the promised inheritance. And so we see two distinct ways in which a land might be conquered. It might be conquered through purpose because that, or through purchase because that gives you a transfer of property ownership, or it might be transferred by the right of conquest. Now Joseph has the sovereignty in relation to Egypt and the nations of the world because Pharaoh submits to his wisdom on account of his having the spirit of God in him. Joseph's wisdom allows him to restructure the economy of Egypt and efficiently feed not only Egypt, not only his family, but also the nations of the world which, who came to Egypt. And these themes, though they're embodied in two quite distinct ways, unite Joseph and Joshua as two angles on a single kaleidoscopic image revealing the splendor of Jesus Christ. Because Christ Jesus is the King of Kings. He is he in whom the whole creation is renewed. He is he who feeds all the nations with bread and wine. He is he who is rejected by his brothers, then he feeds the nations, but ultimately is reconciled with his brothers after having converted the nations. Jesus is the conquering king. He is the new Joshua. When we're told that Joshua and Israel had to apply the harem to the land of Canaan, now set aside, we're going to bracket the questions of the ethics of this. I just want you to focus on the theology and the liturgical nature of it. Uh, the harem means devoted. The land is consecrated. Now some liberal critics amusingly have attempted to interpret these texts and this concept in light of a superstition where there's some kind of negative energy which is transmitted from the Canaanite city. So that's why Achan and his family have to be killed because he's been infected with this negative energy. But in fact it's the exact opposite, which is that God has claimed the land of Canaan for himself. He consecrated the treasure and the spoils of Jeremiah Jericho for himself. So that if one takes of those treasures without divine gift, without divine authorization, one is recapitulating the sin which Adam and Eve committed in the very beginning. Because to take something which is too holy for you is to lay your hand on that which is not yours, to lay your hand on something with which your hand cannot be safely engaged with which you cannot be safely related. You are over-consecrated. You're in over your head. And this, in other imagery, is described as a debt. Okay, so think about the way that we're, we're actually talking about the story. Achan steals treasure from God. He steals treasure. This is wealth. 
So the language of debt is not far off. But a debt, conceptually speaking, is a gap or a disjunction between what one ought to be in relation to another person and what one actually is. What one owes is the quantitative measurement of that disjunction. So this can be expressed in the liturgical language as you've become over-sanctified, not in a moral sense, but in a ritual sense. And the solution to that is to be desanctified. Well, how can you be desanctified? It's by making a reparation offering. And that offering is described in Leviticus chapters 4 and 5. In Isaiah 53, the suffering servant is described as a reparation offering. He is he in whom the human family pays back its infinite debt to God, restoring and healing the rupture of the relationship between God, the human family, and the creation, and allowing us to enter into that relationship and place our own gifts on top of the infinite gift of Christ. And the imperfections in our gifts are perfected by virtue of their union with the perfect Christ. So when Joshua devotes the land to destruction, this anticipates the work of Jesus because what Jesus does is he baptizes the whole world. Baptizing the world, in essence, is Jesus' sprinkling the world with holy water. Think about the language in the theology of the flood. What happens in the flood? God purifies the creation. The creation was collapsing in on itself because it is sustained in the memory of God, embodied in the mind of man, and that relationship is opened up and perpetuated through the sacrificial system under the Old Covenant, but with almost every human being except eight having rebelled against God in the most heinous ways conceivable, that circuit which guaranteed the continued existence of the creation had broken, and the creation began to collapse in on itself. So what has to happen is there has to be a holy environment, an environment which is consecrated to God and which is placed under the authority of a legitimate and rightly worshiping high priest, and that's Noah. This holy environment is the ark. The ark is described in terms of a temple, a sanctuary, the precise dimensions which are given for the construction of the ark anticipate many biblical texts which describe the same precision in the construction of sanctuaries. The ark has three stories, just as the tabernacle, the temple, and other sanctuaries in and outside of the Near East uh, will have a tripartite structure. You have the courtyard, you have the holy place, you have the holy of holies. Uh, you have the courtyard, you have the nave, you have the inner sanctuary. And that's the language used for the temple. And so Noah creates this holy environment. It is a temple, a consecrated space, which is the seed from which the creation can grow up again. And what happens then? The heavens are opened. Now, this language isn't just a matter of phenomenological language in terms of, you know, their water was coming down from above. The language of the heavens has very profound theological freight to it. Water from heaven brings sanctification. In the ritual of the Day of the Atonement, the high priest as a representative of the nation Israel and as a representative of the human family more generally would liturgically purify the creation, thus covering over the accumulated sins of Israel's past year. And that purification would take place by an ascent upwards through every level of the tabernacle and a sevenfold sprinkling on every aspect of the tabernacle. Now, the story of the flood has a uh, literary structure which corresponds to the days of creation. And this is true in multiple ways, but I just want you to pay attention to the fact that you have water from heaven. Okay, this is sacred water. This is holy water. Water from heaven is sprinkled on the ark. Now, the ark has what is called a covering. And the word for covering here is the very word is very closely related to the word used for mercy seat in the scriptures. Because the word used for mercy seat signifies that golden covering 
placed over the Ark of the Covenant, a golden covering which signifies the splendor of the presence of God, which we'll anticipate in Revelation chapter 14, the sea mixed with the fire of the Holy Spirit after the day of Pentecost. And so the sprinkling of the Ark of the Covenant in the Day of Atonement as the anointing of the heavenly sanctuary, which is enacted most perfectly in the work of Jesus, well, this looks back to the story of the flood, in addition to looking forward to the story of Jesus. In the story of the flood, you have a covering placed over the ark. It is sprinkled with water from heaven. This holy environment is consecrated and elevated by the cooperative activity of both God and Noah. And the same water which destroyed the wicked of the world exalts and elevates Noah. Noah doesn't just survive, he is lifted up to the top of the holy mountain. He then builds an altar, reinforcing the liturgical and ritual terminology which runs through this whole story. He builds an altar and he sacrifices all the clean animals. People say that, well, this is an anachronism. Why is there a distinction between clean and unclean animals? I mean, this is just such a failure to read the text. It's maddening because the function of the distinction between clean and unclean is obvious here. Clean animals are those animals which were sacrificially legitimate for the nations of the world, whereas Israel had a much more restricted set of sacrificially acceptable animals, and their diet was constituted exclusively of those animals which were sacrificially acceptable for the nations of the world. So Israel is a holy nation, but Noah builds this altar on the top of Mount Ararat, and he offers an ascension offering. Olah does not refer in terms of the actual meaning of the word to burnt. It doesn't have to do with burning. It has to do with ascension. Because the animal is killed, that's its death. It's then divided up. It's divided in two, and then it's reunited in a single glorious ascent of smoke. So this is the major theme we read about throughout the scriptures. You have to divide first, and then in bringing the two divided parts back together, the thing is glorified. God cuts Adam in two in Genesis chapter two, and then he brings them back together in the union of Adam and Eve. But this is humanity, not just in its original form. He's not just been made one again, but he's been made one in the midst of Tunis. He has been made one in the midst of glory and through glorification. Genesis chapter 15, we see the language of deep sleep used, uh, the only other time in the book of Genesis it's used in Genesis 2 is right here. And Abraham divides the sacrificial animals, and then he has a vision where the Holy Spirit, the fire of God, passes between the parts of the sacrificial animals, sealing them back together, as it were. So, the consecrated environment, which exists in the ark, provides the paradigm and the language according to which we can understand what's going on in the book of Joshua. In the book of Joshua, what's going on is God has claimed the land of Israel as his own for an inheritance. He has consecrated it, and he shares with the children of Israel that land which is uniquely consecrated to him, which has a special relationship to his divine splendor. And Joshua, as the instrument by which the sanctification of the land is accomplished, as the instrument by which the presence of God comes into the land so that the wicked are destroyed and the covenant people are given their inheritance. And these two things always will happen at the same time, right? The fire which burns the wicked, which burns the Dabba Nebihu, is the same fire which glorifies prophets like Isaiah, the water which drowns the wicked, not only in the flood, but also in the story of the priests of Baal, the water which drowns the wicked is the water which purifies the creation, providing a new day for the northern kingdom of Israel and elevating Noah as an ascension up to God as his exaltation. Joshua, as the successor to Moses, is he in whom this promise of consecration and this promise of a consecrated inheritance is enacted. And Joshua is named Jesus because he anticipates and signifies the messianic vocation 
of our Lord Jesus. And so the succession of Moses to Joshua anticipates and typifies according to the inner structure of the Pentateuch and the book of Joshua itself. This is not a later retrojection, but according to its own internal logic, we can see how Joshua functions as an anticipation of Israel's Messiah. Moreover, we can see how Joshua has to be read through the lens of Joseph. In the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, uh, we, we read that Jesus speaks from the prophets about the illumination of the nations, and the people of the synagogue say, is this not the son of Joseph? Well, there's a double meaning here. It refers on the one hand to Jesus being the adopted son of Joseph, who was the bridegroom of the Holy Virgin, but it also refers to Jesus functioning as the Messiah son of Joseph. So the Messiah son of David, the Messiah son of Joseph, it's a really pervasive concept in Judaism. But many Jewish commentators hold them to be the same figure, and I think that's the defensible view. The Messiah son of Joseph, is this not the son of Joseph? This is how kingship is exercised. This is how the creation is restructured and brought into the glorious presence of God. Conquest and harvest are two aspects or two spins on the same kind of set of imagery. It is the same lyric expressed in two very different rhythms. So we can see that the Pentateuch is ordered towards the transition of leadership from Moses to Moses' successor, and that's the one in whom the inheritance is actually given. But as I pointed out, this is no accident. We are given a theological explanation for why the Pentateuch ends in exile. The Pentateuch ends in exile because prophetically speaking, it is as if Israel never entered the land in the first place. Now, one would have to qualify exactly what we mean there because God does concretely move forward his purpose while Israel is in the land. But in terms of the imagery that we should be thinking of when we read the Pentateuch, the reason that it ends in exile, the reason that it ends with Moses and Israel overlooking the land of inheritance and not actually stepping into that land until the book of Joshua, is because we have just been given in Deuteronomy 29 a prophetic word telling us it, in a rock-solid guarantee that Israel is going to break the covenant. So we have Deuteronomy 27 to 28, a series of blessings and curses. You will be blessed with life and multiplication, and the creation will produce fruit for you if you are faithful to God. But if you rebel against God, you will be the tail of the nations. They will oppress you. You will not bless the nations. You will not lend to the nations. You'll be enslaved to them through debt. And ultimately, you will be exiled by the powerful Gentile kingdoms that I, the God of Israel, raises up. And so you give them blessings and curses. Moses says, choose life. Choose to choose the way of blessing, and then we're told, you're not going to choose the way of blessing. Moses prophesies, it's, it, you will be unfaithful. But this isn't an arbitrary prophecy. We're given a reason for understanding why Israel's infidelity is so inevitable in this context. I want you to consider the language that is used in Deuteronomy 29, the first verse I have up here. Uh, and Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, You have seen, pay attention to that language, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all servants, to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs, those wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a heart to understand, or eyes to see, or ears to to hear. Now there are many things that are that's going on in this text. One aspect of the text pertains to idolatry because it is an idol who has eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear. It is an inert idol and we become what we worship. As the psalmist says, those who worship them will become like them. And so when we worship that, which is not God, which does not have life in itself, we are separated from the source of life and enter into corruption and death. And in the disposition of our will, this manifests in concupiscence, the tendency towards evil, which is at war with our inclination towards good given to us in virtue of our creation in the image of God. So an idol has eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear. And Israel worshiping idols becomes 
like that. They become calloused. They weren't always this resistant. That resistance develops and is firmed up as they continue to resist. We can see the language of Israel becoming like the idols they worship elsewhere in the Pentateuch, for example, and Israel is called stiff-necked. Well, stiff-necked uh, is language most natural for cattle because you have the worship of the golden calf. So we have this language of eyes to see, ears to hear. Israel doesn't have that. Uh, note that in Isaiah chapter 6, the very same language is used when God uh, articulates Isaiah's prophetic ministry as intensifying and making manifest the sickness which exists within Israel, such that it will accumulate up to the point where it is placed on Jesus the Messiah who destroys it. Go watch my video, The Cross of Christ from Old to New Testament, if you want a fuller account of the way that actually works. But I want you to pay attention to the language of the heart here, because the heart is the governing principle, it's the capital of the body, and I just want to throw this out there, we should not be so quick to assume that language of the heart relating to mental activity or the language of kidneys relating to mental activity, we should not be so quick to assume that this is just allegorical language. I think that we should, on a prima facie level, uh, uh, consider the idea that the heart plays a significant role in our conscious subjective life and the same is true of the kidneys and actually there is developing scientific work which underscores this principle look at the heart math institute for example which jp Moreland recommended i don't endorse everything that they say there but they provide a wealth of evidence um, that's very intriguing if nothing else of the significant role that the heart actually plays in our emotional life, in our intuition, in our empathy, so on and so forth. So that's kind of a side note. But pay attention to the heart because the heart, even if it's just an allegorical use of language, the heart is the spiritual capital of the person. It is the seat of the will. It is in one's heart that one deliberates and acts upon good or evil. That's why throughout Deuteronomy, we're told again and again, do not lift up your heart. Don't, and don't, don't say in your heart, my hand has gotten me all this wealth. Don't lift up your heart against God. Don't say in your heart, I don't need God to get this inheritance. It is the heart which is the source of the spiritual disease afflicting Israel and the human family more broadly. So, the question must be raised if you've never heard this story before and you get to Deuteronomy 29 and Moses then tells you that the covenant is going to be broken and all of the curses which he's just warned Israel about will come to pass. You have to wonder what's the point. Well, in the Pentateuch, there is a structure where the introduction to the text is Genesis chapters 1 to 11. That's the primeval history. And you have little narratives, which are concluded by little poems. And I'm drawing uh, very heavily on John Selhammer here. Uh, little narratives have little poems. And then you have large narratives, Genesis chapters 12 to 48, for example, followed by a large poem. And there are four such poems in the five book Torah in the Pentateuch, and they relate to each other thematically as well as to the primeval history. For example, we're told that these poems uh, concern those things which will occur in the latter days, with the exception of Exodus 15, which gives us a theological narration of the event of Israel's redemption from Egypt and the establishment of the kingdom of God and the planting of God's sanctuary on his mountain. But in the other three poems, we're told that it won't occur in the latter days. And the word for latter days is the days of the end. It has the relationship to the Hebrew word for beginning that the word end in English has to the, he the English word for beginning. So the Pentateuch begins with in the beginning. And then in these prophetic texts, we are told in the end. You have a protological aspect and you have an eschatological aspect. Now, this eschatological aspect describes the messianic king. Genesis chapter 49 tells us that the messianic king will come from the line of Judah. Not only so, but the mission of the messianic king is articulated in the very language that is used in Genesis 37 to describe Joseph's dreams. 
There's much more one could say on the messianic portrait as it's unfolded in, for example, Numbers 24, but I want to point you to another aspect of the Pentateuch's messianic vision. Note again the language that's used in Deuteronomy 29, those things that the Lord did in the sight of Israel, the things that he did to Egypt. This is how the first redemption and the first covenant was enacted. Well, the Pentateuch is written by Moses, but there are small additions written by later prophetic authors. And I think it's actually you can distinguish them very easily. But when Ezra, in my opinion, um, draws together the whole canon of the Hebrew Bible, Torah prophets writings, he places compositional seams at the uh, at structurally significant points. So, for example, the book of Joshua, the beginning of the book of Joshua is then echoed by the beginning of the book of Psalms. So the beginning of the prophets, that's Joshua, the beginning of the writings, the book of Psalms, because Joshua describes the divine injunction to meditate on the Torah day and night. Well, that's what we read in Psalm chapter one. Blessed is the man who meditates on the Torah day and night. And these macrostructural seams, again, this is John Salehammer, these seams point us to the messianic center of biblical theology. So I want to read to you the end of Deuteronomy 34. And this is the end of the book of Deuteronomy in the Pentateuch. But since then, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his hand. And by all that mighty power and all the great terror that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So we have a prophecy of a prophet like Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18. And here in Deuteronomy 34, we're clearly standing on the other side of Israel's history. To say that there has not since been a prophet like Moses uh, implies that you've seen a number of prophets, but none of them have been like Moses. And the likeness to Moses is quite specific. It is the enactment of a new exodus. We read in Numbers 23 and 24, the, or Numbers 24 specifically, the Messianic king is described as God brings him out of Egypt. The Messianic king is the new Moses. The Messianic king enacts the new Exodus. And that is the distinctive marker of the prophet, like Moses. Moses did all these things in the sight of all Israel. Well, Deuteronomy 29, the Lord has not given you eyes to see or ears to hear. But the prophet, like Moses... The Messianic king, Moses himself is a royal figure, by the way. Um, kings in scripture build and upkeep temples. Moses' oversight and his reception of the vision of the pattern of the tabernacle anticipates David's reception of the vision of the pattern of the temple, which is then built by King Solomon. But throughout the history of Israel, these kings are going to upkeep the temple, keep it clean, and so forth. This is what Moses does uh, in relation to the tabernacle. He himself is not the high priest in a ritual sense that the high priest is his brother Aaron. Uh, one could go on and on about that, but I recommend a, a little book called Royal Motifs in the Pentateuchal Portrait of Moses if you want more evidence in that direction. Uh, So Deuteronomy ends with a implicit um, affirmation of the prophetic hope for the prophet like Moses. And his likeness to Moses will be in that he enacts the new exodus. But what makes the second exodus, the new covenant, any different than the first? Why would Israel not simply go astray again? Well, we're given the answer to this question in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So the Pentateuch begins with exile from the tree of life when Deuteronomy 30 shows us the gathering of the human family back into the tree of life. Deuteronomy 30 describes how after Israel has been subjected to the covenantal curses, uh, God is going to regather them from exile and the Lord your God will circumcise your heart 
and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. There are a few things to take note of here. I want to point you to the phrase, and the heart of your offspring. Now, in the history of Israel, there were righteous generations. For example, in the era of Joshua, we're told that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua. But it seems that in the unfolding and multiplication of the human family, there is something in the disposition of mankind towards evil that we receive from the fall, which uh, obstructs the perpetuation of such righteousness through generations. And the redemption of the human family as the human family, as the single organism, demands a resolution of the inner problem of the flesh. Flesh is that uh, raw material out of which God created the human family. It's like clay. You can mold clay in different ways. And when you put fire on it, it will then be fixed in the form that you have it. But the capacity to mold clay in multiple good ways necessarily carries with it the possibility that it could be molded in a bad way. That's what flesh basically is in Genesis 2. We're told that Adam and Eve became one flesh. Though it's notable that the language of flesh is used specifically in relation to marriage and reproduction. Consider the, the language of flesh in relation to sexual sin. Well, that's because it's so intimately associated with marriage and reproduction. Because reproduction, the multiplication of the human family, is that which perpetuates and expands and develops the human family insofar as they have not yet been completed. The fullness of their number has not yet been reached. But it is the problem of the flesh and, uh, and note again, we have the generation after generation, multiplication. We can see the way in which this, the association of flesh with um, human reproduction might pertain to the failure to keep more than one faithful generation. But we're told in Deuteronomy 30, that problem is going to be fixed. The Lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, that you may live. So we have the language of the heart here, that heart which was the source of iniquity in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Paul in Ephesians refers to the eyes of the heart which apprehend or don't the glory of God. The heart is the center and the throne of the human will, and the Spirit comes and dwells in the heart to harmonize our will with the will of Jesus Christ which the Spirit of God shares, being consubstantial with him. And it is this heart which is inclined towards evil. Jeremiah says, the uh, heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, that's not the whole portrait about human nature. There are other good things said about human nature. It's, scripture speaks of a good inclination as well as an evil inclination. Uh, but we uh, should not cast that aside. I think it's important theologically, but it's also important psychologically. We have to know ourselves. We have to be aware of the potential for evil which exists in each one of us. So, that's the source, the, that's the instrument by which Israel's redemption is accomplished in such a way that the inheritance won't just be something they have for a few generations and then they're cursed and exiled. No, the inheritance is something that will continue to be deepened and expanded and sanctified at, in accordance with the multiplication of the nation. Now, I want to read to you just a bit from Deuteronomy 30. This is a little later in the passage. Um, uh, let's find it here. Ah. Uh, this commandment which I command you today, is Moses speaking, is not too mysterious, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, i.e. Moses goes into heaven and gets the Torah, uh, that we may hear and do it, nor is it beyond the sea, Israel crosses the sea to get to the mountain, mountain where they receive the Torah, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea, for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. Now, many people quote this text 
and they use it essentially to reject the notion of concupiscence or the notion of original sin. But they fundamentally miss the point, which is that this narration right here is describing the praise of Israel on the day that their heart is circumcised. The word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you should do it. The word is that which circumcises the children of Israel, and it's that which circumcises their heart and allows them to corporately, over the long term, be faithful to God in the Torah so that they might have life. This brings about a reconciliation between God and the children of Israel, a reconciliation which uh, removes the need for Moses to act as a boundary between God and and Israel. Consider when God comes down on Sinai, the people are afraid because they're in the flesh. This is not sin, but they're afraid, they're terrified, and they say, we cannot endure the voice of God. It is too much for us. Moses has to go and mediate. He functions as kind of human curtain in the architecture of the tabernacle. Well, with the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus is the new Moses, but he is not a degree of separation between man and God. He is the instrument by which man and God are not separated, the instrument by which they are reconciled. We can see here that the prior condition of Israel described in these hypothetical questions, who will go up to heaven and get us the Torah? Who will go across the sea and get us the Torah? This refers to the necessity of creaturely mediation in the Old Covenant prior to the sanctification and circumcision of Israel's heart, which allowed them to engage directly with the splendor of God without being totally annihilated. Now, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, uh, the Lord comes in the spirit of the day to Adam and Eve. It's not him walking in the cool of the garden. He comes in the spirit, in glory, in this thunderous presence uh, of the day, that is the day of judgment, the day of the Lord. Naturally, Adam and Eve are afraid and they hide. And that reaction is repeated again and again throughout the scriptures whenever God makes himself known covenantally uh, to his people. And so you don't have to go, you don't, we don't have to send a mediator to go and get the Torah from heaven. We don't have to send a mediator to go across the sea and get the Torah. No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you should do it. Now, this text is quoted in the letter to the Romans, chapter 10, specifically in reference to, to the new covenant. Romans 2, 25 to 29 describes the circumcision of the heart, a circumcision of the heart which applies not only to Jews, but also to the Gentiles who are united through the remnant of Israel to Jesus the Messiah. Their heart is circumcised. They share in the promise of Deuteronomy, chapter 30. Romans 10 quotes Deuteronomy 30 uh, directly. Romans 2, 25, 29 alludes to it with the heart circumcision. Romans 10 quotes it directly in describing the way in which the word enacts redemption for both Israel and the nations alike. So, a couple other things here, and then, and then we will wrap up. Exodus chapter 4. Now in Exodus chapter 4, this is when Moses encounters God. God discloses his name to Moses, and the name encapsulates the divine character. So the name is a revelation of God's qualities. God is telling Moses, and then he'll later tell Israel, what he's all about. And it is through Israel that the nations learn what God is all about, which is why uh, we are told that he shows his power in Pharaoh so that his name might be proclaimed across all the earth. And it's a success because after the plagues, after the exodus, there's a mixed multitude of the nations who comes out with Israel. So the revelation of the name concerns the active and dynamic disclosure of his character. And God's character is disclosed in his redemptive and glorifying work in the history of creation. And so in Exodus chapters 3 and 4, where God reveals himself to Moses as the great I am, uh, God will give him prophetic signs. And these prophetic signs are not meant to simply say, oh, I can do miracles, therefore God's at work. No, the prophetic signs signify the nature of the redemption, which will extend from this point all the way into the messianic work of Jesus. So this is what God says uh, 
oh, I just want to say that, that Moses has a staff, right? The staff signifies dominion. The staff turns into the serpent, right? And then Moses grasps the serpent from which he had fled. He grasps the serpent and thus reveals and manifests his dominion over the serpent. Moses is an image of the seed. We saw how the Messiah is a second Moses or the last Moses. Moses is a royal figure. The Messiah is the messianic king. Moses is the one in whom the prophetic promise of the victory of mankind over the seed of the woman is anticipated. Moses exercises dominion over the serpent by grasping his tail and forcing him to become a staff. Well, the victory in terms of our external enemies is complemented and is necessarily coextensive with this other prophetic sign, which concerns not our external enemy, not the devil who's tempting us, but our internal enemy, the corruption that exists in our heart. Exodus 4, 6, 7. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak, speaking to Moses. And he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Now you have to think visually here. You have to think concretely. What is going on is Moses is placing his hand within his cloak over his heart. And when he takes it out again, the quality of the human heart as it exists after the fall is made manifest. It's not bright with divine glory. No, it's ill. It's leprous. And leprosy in the scriptures is a way of signifying the sickness and disease of death. Now, this is not the kind of leprosy that we know in, in modern medicine. Uh, there's no evidence that this leprosy, for example, uh, uh, was in any way deadly. It's a liturgical or ritual illness, but it signifies corruption and it signifies death. So, for example, in Isaiah 53, we're told that the servant of the Lord, who is Jesus, is stricken for the transgressors. Well, the word for stricken here refers specifically to being stricken with leprosy. And the servant of the Lord is the embodiment of the nation Israel, who corporately is called the servant in Isaiah 42. Uh, but the servant takes on Israel's destiny and then multiplies the nation so that in everyone who exists in the, ser uh, the, the servant, um, the Davidic covenant is fulfilled. It's a nation of David. It's, an, it's a nation of messiahs. So the servant takes on the destiny of Israel. And he's stricken, and that goes back to Isaiah chapter 1, where we read, The whole body is sick from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot. So the idea of illness, the idea of illness signifying corruption, a corruption which is ritually identified in uh, the laws about leprosy, a corruption which is taken on by the servant and then healed through him. Um, this is what is going on in the background and the foreground of Exodus Four. This is what Exodus 4 is based on, and it is what Exodus 4 anticipates. Moses takes out his hand, which he's just placed over his heart, and he sees the death that flows out from his heart. Leviticus chapter 13 helps to draw all of these things together. Now, this is describing the laws concerning biblical leprosy, which, remember, is not modern leprosy. It's not going to kill you. Um, there's no direct evidence from Scripture that it would actually harm you medically in any way, but it makes you liturgically and ritually unclean. But Leviticus 13 says, When raw flesh appears on him, he shall be unclean. Unclean means you can't engage, you, can't, you cannot offer sacrifice, you cannot go into the presence of God. And the priest shall examine the raw flesh and pronounce him unclean. Raw flesh is unclean for it is a leprous disease. But if the flesh recovers and turns white again, then he shall come to the priest and then so on and so forth. The um, details of the ritual are then uh, spelled out and unfolded. Now notice the word flesh here. New Testament scholars fall all over themselves trying to explain what in the world Paul meant by flesh. And yet they many of them at least, apparently ignore the fact that Leviticus and the Pentateuch refers to flesh a hundred, hundred plus times. When Paul in Romans 5 describes death as a disease spreading from the head of the human family to all those descended from Adam, 
it should not be that large of a leap to understand that what's going on is Paul is articulating the theology of the human family in and through the ritual logic of the book of Leviticus. Now, why do I mention flesh in this context, other than just an opportunity to rag on silly biblical scholarship? I mention flesh because of the notion of circumcision, and this is what's going to draw all of these threads together. What is circumcision? Circumcision is the removal of the flesh. Circumcision is the removal of the flesh from the instrument of reproduction. And the instrument of reproduction is that means by which God perpetuates his creative work in and through the human family. What the devil wants to do is thwart that work. He wants to block God's work at every turn by actively attacking the children of Adam and by corrupting them. So we have the serpent whom Moses exercises dominion over and you have the human heart, which is filled with death in part because of the serpent in part because of our uh, cooperation with the serpent. Circumcision is the removal of the flesh so that the holy seed is preserved, so that a new birth composed 100% of life might be accomplished. Well, the language of the cutting off of the flesh in Genesis chapter 17, so that the holy seed is preserved, well, this looks back to the story of the flood. The story of the flood, the uh, God says, I am going to cut off all flesh. Moses or, or Noah is then told to gather all kinds of seed onto the ark. After the flood, when the ark ascends Mount Ararat, what are we told? Well, he plants some of those seeds. He plants a vineyard. So the notion of circumcision being an image of the redemption and purification of the cosmos writ large is not just some you know cute allegory uh, it's something which is rooted uh, from beginning to end in the logic of the hebrew bible and deuteronomy 36 in case you're you're not picking up on the connection here it's deuteronomy 30 verse 6 which describes the healing of the human heart and thus the resurrection of humanity. Um, resurrection in terms of first we enter into the life of God, and ultimately that life then flows through humanity such that it extends to a bodily resurrection, the glorification of the body uh, in a way that it is incorruptible and it cannot die again. So circumcision, it shows the purification, the ritual uh, transfiguration of the world, and ritual language uh, signifies the presence or lack thereof of divine life. Circumcision of the world, circumcision of the heart. And this is the problem which is addressed in the New Covenant. So when the Pentateuch is considered as a text, when it's not just when Torah is not just considered as a particular covenant, but it's considered as a five book text with its own thematic structure, with its own emphases that belong to the intention of the divine and the human author. We can see that as John Salehammer says, the central thread in the five book Torah is not obedience to the old covenant. The Torah is a prophetic book. It is oriented from Genesis to Deuteronomy to the coming of Israel's Messiah. And Israel's Messiah is a, one who fulfills the role of prophet like Moses. He is the king. He is the seed of the woman. He is the one who destroys and crushes the head of the serpent. And he is the one who heals the human heart. Because under the old covenant, Israel, like all the nations, was in the flesh. Israel was in Adam. Israel had the corruption of death. And as long as that corruption of death was unhealed, the root of the problem would go unaddressed. So the prophetic hope of the Pentateuch lies not in the first covenant, 
but it lies instead in the new covenant, a new covenant which is associated with the new exodus, which is associated with the messianic king, which is associated in Numbers 24 as elsewhere with the in gathering of the nations. We're told in Numbers 24 about Abraham's seed. It says, his seed shall be in many waters. Abraham shall be father of many nations. The waters of the world, that symbolically corresponds to the Gentile nations. Daniel chapter 7, uh, the great sea is stirred, then the Gentile kingdoms rise out of the sea. The book of Jonah, even though he could reach Nineveh by land, in the book of Jonah, Jonah goes to this Gentile kingdom over the sea. There are many other texts one can refer to. Uh, but his seed should be in many waters is a way of expressing the reality that Abraham is father of many nations. When God divides Abraham in two, now obviously one part is much, much, much smaller than the other part, but it is a division in two, which echoes in some ways the division of Adam and Eve. I'm talking about the circumcision. Uh, God is not just creating Jews, God is creating Gentiles, because these two categories are understood only in relation uh, to one another. Uh, and both of these uh, branches of Abraham's family in Genesis 17 relate to Abraham in a covenantal sense. Now, I'm not saying that we're all Ishmaelites, but I am saying that there's a two-house structure, which is repeated and echoed throughout Moses and the prophets, such that the Gentile in gathering is associated with the ingathering of the ten northern tribes. Zechariah 14. And by the way, I basically finished the subject of this video, so you can cut out if you, you want to go. I'm just going to finish my uh, train of thought. Uh, Zechariah, uh, I believe it's Zechariah chapter 10, describes 10 men who take hold of the fringe of a Jew or a Judahite, one from the tribe of Judah. Now, when you see it as referring to Judah, the number 10 takes on a greater significance because Judah is the southern kingdom. 10 is the number of the 10 northern tribes. Well, why is it that the northern kingdom is called Israel when Israel refers to the whole nation? Because Jacob says concerning his uh, sons, his son Joseph and his grandsons, the half tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, my name shall go through you. So as James, this is something I got from James Jordan. It's amazing how these little details uh, serve to explain all sorts of subtle questions in Scripture that I think we, we assume that had no intelligible uh, explanation. Uh, in Genesis, we are told that Ephraim shall become many nations. Uh, we're told in the prophets that God will sow the northern kingdom to the nations. Now, what the actual significance of the northern kingdom is concretely, as a concrete entity in relation to the concrete Gentile nations of the world, and why that is covenantally significant in terms of the inner wiring of the world and the structure of the covenant, I am not sure. Something I'm still considering, because there is no instance in scripture or history where something is merely a type or merely a spiritual representation. In God's divine economy, things are typological because they themselves are instances within which God is actively moving forward his purpose in history. And because God is one and he moves forward history in a regular and aesthetically pleasing pattern, this moving forward can be given shape in typological structure. But if we are speaking of the association of the ten tribes of the northern kingdom with the Gentile nations of the world, I'm simply not satisfied saying, well, the one is a symbol of the other. It seems to me that the scriptures indicate that there's a much more concrete and specific relationship, which is constituted by the fact that Israel is sown to the nations. If you have thoughts on that, I would actually uh, very much appreciate your thoughts. So, the Pentateuch, its hope is in the New Covenant. The New Covenant is in the Messiah. The Messiah circumcises the heart. The circumcision of the heart heals our flesh. It resurrects our dead. It is the redemption of mankind from the fall of Adam, the crushing of the serpent. Christianity is true. Deal with it. All right. Um, I will see you all tomorrow.